I'm Sonia Minnis, Research Director at the Schubert Center for Child Studies and faculty member at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. I'm glad you've joined us today for what will likely be an exciting set of presentations and discussions amongst our panelists. The Schubert Center for Child Studies is proud to host this event with our international partners, the Center for Social Sciences in Hungary, the University of Geneva's Center for Children's Rights Studies, and Eberlin Publishing. Dr. Brian Grand, today's discussion uh, moderator, is a distinguished professor of law and sociology at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. He teaches broadly in the area of social and historical research methods, human rights, law and society, and social policy, and was recently the recipient of our university's highest teaching honor, the Dykhoff Graduate Student Teaching Award. Among his many honors, Dr. Graham was recently named a Jefferson Science Fellow. He chaired the Human Rights Section of the American Sociological Association and was a former Fulbright Scholar. Most recently, he was awarded a research grant from the U.S. National Science Foundation to study COVID-19 and derogation of human rights. Importantly, Dr. Grant has co-edited the new book titled The Roles of Independent Children's Rights Institution in Advancing Human Rights of Children with Dr. Agnes Lux. This book and its contributors have provided the basis for this discussion today. First, I will welcome uh, Lydia Baylog for additional opening remarks. Dr. Brian Graham will introduce our panelists and then each panelist will provide about 15 minutes of content highlighting their unique experiences and expertise in advancing the rights of children. Dr. Carl Hansen, Professor of Law and Director of the University of Geneva's Center for Children's Rights Studies will provide commentary and lead a discussion with the panelists. Following the discussion, Dr. Brian Graham will take questions submitted by our viewers and pose them to the panelists. If you have questions, please feel free to place them in the Q&A section of the webinar at any point, and Brian will try to pose as many questions to the panelists as time allows. We are recording today's discussion. In a few days, it will be available to access on the Schubert Center for Child Studies website for additional review and sharing with others. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing your questions uh, for the panelists. Now I'd like to turn this over to Lydia Baylog for additional opening remarks. Sure. Uh, so hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning, sorry, <laughs> respectively. Um, and on behalf of the co one of the co-host organizations, um, uh, Center for Social Sciences, which is seated in Hungary, Budapest, let me greet the participants of the event um, as well. And let me greet uh, the audience as well, which is also pretty uh, international, as far as I suppose. Uh, so my name is Lydia Balog, and I work as a research fellow for one of the institutes of the uh, mentioned center, uh, which is Institute for Legal Studies. Um, the main objective of our institute is, is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, the institute takes an active part in developing legal scholarship and in organizing professional events and activities for legal scholars in Hungary. And in order to facilitate that, the, the institute aims to establish cooperation with other domestic research institutions, uh, mostly operating within university law schools and offers its infrastructure to discussions on current legal uh, uh, topics and then the other relevant issues. And on the other hand, the researchers of the Institute publish their scientific results um, at an international level and contribute to the discourse on international legal scholarship. Moreover, the Institute is actively working to set up an effective collaboration or effective collaborations with, with foreign research partners as well, and, and uh, actively seeking to bring foreign researchers directly into the Institute's activities. Um, and uh, as for myself, um, uh, I work for the Department of Legal Theory, the Sociology of Law and the History of Law, and my research interest is prim primarily um, connected to, to anti-discrimination uh, with a special focus on equality between men and women, um, minority rights and minority protection are, are also um, 
my um, uh, research areas, uh, and I'm the editor of the uh, or journal uh, called in Hungarian Alam and Alam is uh, uh, journal for state and, and legal studies in, in English, uh, and I'm chair of the research ethics committee of the center. So again, a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you, Lydia. Uh my name is Brian Grant, and I, um, as, as Sonia mentioned, I'm the moderator today. But I do want to thank everyone for being here and joining the webinar. Um, as Lydia mentioned, it's an international group, and we're very happy. Um, I want to thank uh, Case Western Schubert Center, uh, the Center for Social Sciences, uh, from which Lydia and Agnes come, um, the University of Geneva Center for Children's Rights Studies and Emerald Publishing. I also want to thank our panelists today. We're grateful for their presentations. Um, and the chapters they contributed to the book that Agnes and I edited. Uh, it's an understatement to say that I'm an admirer of their work um, and their many contributions to scholarship as well as policy. I want to introduce our first uh, panelist. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Ursula Kilkelly and Emily Logan. Ursula is professor of law of University College Cork um, and is a distinguished scholar. Emily is commissioner, commissioner of Garda Shiana. Ombudsman Commission. Uh, the Garda are law enforcement for Ireland, uh, and the commission's dedicated to providing efficient, fair, and independent oversight of policing in Ireland. Emily is also, is also Ireland's first Ombudsman for children from 2003 to 2014. I'm very grateful to have them here, and I'll, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian and colleagues. It's great to be with you all, um, and welcome to sunny Cork. Um, it's it's wonderful to have this opportunity to share with you our uh, research that that Emily and I have been doing together on um, Ireland's Ombudsman for Children, but particularly in the in the international comparative context. Um, our contribution comes out of the work that we did originally to to publish a book. Uh, with Palgrave on, on the work of um, the Ombudsman for Children in that international context, looking to understand how a, a national institution for children works within its legislative framework, but also works at the margins of how these powers can best be used to advance children's rights. And we're really pleased to be part uh, of Brian and Agnes's um, contribution, um, out of the collection rather, um, also, because it allowed us to delve a little bit deeper into this whole concept of soft power and how important it is for institutions uh, like the Ombudsman for Children to uh, maximise the potential that they have uh, through the role and the post holder themselves and their authority and integrity, but also using leadership and strategy and all these other elements that are really important in, in an office like this. So I'm going to take the first three slides and I'm going to hand over to, to Emily, who's going to take um, the last two. So um, I'll keep an eye on, on time as I go through. If you go on to the next uh, slide, please. And to give this a couple of um, slides of context, Ireland's um, can, I suppose modern journey with children's rights really started with our ratification of the convention in 1992. Um, and that really uh, prompted a whole wave of activity, of advocacy, of research, and I think the birth of our modern children's rights movement here in Ireland through the establishment of a very large coalition called the Children's Rights Alliance in 1995. And very early on, the Alliance and others really set a marker down around the expectation for the establishment of a national children's rights institution. And politically, that gained support um, through the um, numerous child abuse inquiries, which really shone a light on how poorly children were regarded, not just with, when, within the context of child protection, but also their standing, their visibility, the way in which children were perceived uh, clearly and was politically and publicly understood needed a, a step change, uh, needed much stronger visibility at a national and government level. And, and following um, on from Ireland's ratification, when we appeared first before the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, the, the committee recommended the establishment of a national institution for children. Interestingly, the Alliance had commissioned some research uh, in the, those early days also, again, building, I suppose, a research base, uh, um, the case for a national institution of, for, for Ireland. Um, and interestingly, out of that process, a politically acceptable model of ombudsman was chosen and really being preferred 
uh, we think out of a level of familiarity with the ombuds model we had a very a well respected ombudsman a general ombudsman in place at the time and so that led to the establishment of the ombudsman for children act in 2002 and, and as brian has said emily was then appointed through open competition appointed by the president um, as ireland's first ombudsman uh, in 2003 and i'll move on to the, the next uh, slide please so to a little bit of background, I suppose, about that children's rights context within Ireland, some of which largely does, does relate to what happened subsequent to that period. Ireland has a written constitution. Um, it is, though, part of a dualist tradition um, where the convention is not part of domestic law. So we have not incorporated the convention uh, in full. We have, however, enjoyed a sectoral incorporation where particularly the best interest principle and the right of the child to be heard have, have started to become more commonplace in our laws and policies. And I think it's fair to say that we have seen since Ireland's ratification a, a gradual shift um, politically and socially in the, the visibility of children, their status, and um, particularly their status in uh, and among government. Um, in, in government decision making and, and law and policy. And a hugely significant part of that was the early creation of a full cabinet ministry of, of a minister for children, um, which accompanied obviously the establishment of its own government department and a whole a national strategy first adopted in 2000 and subsequently followed up by further national plan uh, which also um, uh, sought to coordinate implementation of the convention was really looking to bring together a whole government approach um, and those were important um, parallel developments because uh, not just they allowed the ombudsman to engage with with very substantive real um, um, program for change around children's rights but they also in our view um, were um, were I suppose came about as a result of the advocacy that the office did so there's a really interesting the developing culture of respect for children's rights and, and the creation of a visibility and understanding that the ombudsman for children had a really uh, an important leadership role in uh, the constitutional referendum which Emily might say something about later on uh, was uh, a pivotal moment in 2012, whereby a referendum, public vote, uh, the, the public vote to strengthen children's rights in the Irish constitution. And so that was really, as I said, part, a hugely important part of the campaigning work that the Ombudsman did, but also was, was change and an opportunity that the Ombudsman could leverage for other, other gains and, and benefits. Um, I'll move on then to, to talk on the next slide to, to, to the powers um, on, and the authority of the Ombudsman for Children set out in legislation, as I said, and, and really a very comprehensive um, model of Ombudsman, combining, I think, what we would expect to see in a Commissioner for Children, uh, which, which Bruce and will we'll talk about in a second, but also this Ombuds, the, the complaints function, which has really been at the cornerstone of the Irish model uh, since its establishment in, uh, in 2002, 2004. Um, so we have, in, in effect, in the legislation, um, the child's right to complain against public bodies with regard to their treatment on a range of grounds, uh, largely relating to um, public policy grounds and decision making um, uh, and use of power and so on. Um, and that, can, that um, process has continued to grow um, in importance. Um, it is an, a, a cornerstone really of, of the current office. Um, and has played an important role also in allowing the Ombudsman to keep an ear to the ground on what the issues are for children uh, and their families. Um, and again, equally on the other side of that, how are these issues being perceived by public bodies? And what's the response of those public bodies? And our work in this space has been really interesting because in another role, I am um, 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 uh, chair of a board where I've been subject to some of these um, complaints. And so I've had to learn from both sides, really, how best this can work for children. And that's been a really interesting process and a part, really interesting part, I think, of, of Emily and, our, and my dialogue on these, on these issues. The office also has the power to um, undertake own volition investigations, which has been very uh, systematically used at times, really important to have that almost reserve power to, to take action where there is a serious concern and the office has played an important role in particularly in child protection, mobilizing change in that area. 
Um, the broader powers around promotion and awareness raising have also been very effectively used as a reference there to the big ballot, uh, which was really where the office starting off on its journey um, on a national campaign of advocacy and awareness raising, engaging with children uh, in their communities and their schools around the issues that are important to them, started a really important baseline um, of, of awareness raising and a relationship with, the, if you like, the children of Ireland by the Ombudsman's was really important. A novel um, campaign was undertaken and then was copied by other uh, institutions um, subsequently. Um, the office has a really important um, power to um, offer independent advice and guidance to government and spent and has spent um, significant time responding uh, to consultations, government consultations, uh, but also undertaking analyses of the uh, law and policy proposals and in a vast array of areas, some of which are squarely to do with children, as you'd expect, child protection, uh, for example, changes to the law around sexual offences, and but also where children are indirectly impacted, um, and I mentioned sexual offences is one example of that. So really looking to use this power to force governments to think differently about what they perceive to be uh, relevant to children um, and, and impact for, impacting on children. I think that's really an important part of, of exploring the breadth of the role of, of an institution like this. Consultation with children, as I mentioned, has been critically important. And, and again, we can say a little bit more about that, but seeing children under legislation, given a, a primary role in the office has really been very influential as has the relationship with research. And Emily led the way, in my view, in really ensuring that the office from a very early stage was evidence-based. And you can see the, the, um, the work that I did at the, in the early days on, on, on identifying barriers to children's rights in Ireland, really setting the office up uh, with that evidence base to explore um, then in practice what, what the major issues were and how those could be addressed. So what we see is this really interesting combination of powers very clearly set out in the law, but also the sort of interchange between the different powers where they're not seen in their silos, but they're actually all interconnected. The learning from one area has been brought into another in quite a dynamic way, combining the watchdog with also the, the need to stay close to children and children's issues. And we see that in, in the relevance uh, of leadership and strategy all coming to play and how these our, how these powers are, are exercised. So Emily's going to talk now um, uh, to the next slides. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ursula. Um, perhaps just to give you some context here, in terms of Ireland's relationship with the United Nations, um, Ireland has been a member of the United Nations since 19. 55 and as a small island on the edge of Europe with a population of 5 million membership of the UN has been really central to Ireland's for, foreign policy. So hearings before the UN committee have been a, a big deal in Ireland um, and generally treated with great um, gravity. That's just demonstrated by generally there would be a minister for government. In this case, it's a minister for children and a large delegation will be sent to Geneva to sit before the committee to publicly and internationally account for its progress or not in relation to the convention. Um, what I would say is in terms of the systematic um, influence of law and policy in relation to the convention, much of the work, you'll hear most ombudsmen and commissioners for children talk about the UN convention almost as if it's a strategic tool. So it's a very accessible tool, not only for an institution that has the enforcement or legal powers, but it's also a really good tool for NGOs and civil society and any advocate who's trying to speak in a universal way about children's rights. So in Ireland, you heard Ursula refer to the constitutional change, one of the most significant changes in Ireland that took place over a period of six years with that battle and lobbying with six submissions from the Ombudsman for Children's Office uh, to Parliament. It ranges from things like child protection to children seeking international protection, children in detention. So there's quite a variety of changes in law and policy, much of which certainly in terms of the Ombudsman's work and activity has been centered on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. What I would say is though, although I'm describing a very, um, a lot of interest in Ireland, both not only in government circles, but also amongst the population, the general populace in terms of what happens in the international 
stage in relation to Ireland's um, performance, if you like, on an international stage and our, our reputation, in our international reputation for children's rights. When all of that is over, when the excitement of that is over, and generally the media excitement is quite short lived, it lasts sometimes days at a maximum, maybe a week. But after that, that's really when the Ombudsman for Children and the Commissioner's role kicks in to be that relentless um, institution that is constantly there, that is the constant, and has the proximity to what's going on. They have the proximity to children themselves, proximity to the institutions, and then the power and the influence to act as the catalyst for the enforcement of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it's been very exciting to be in Geneva and it's, it's um, very influential, but the responsibility for the consistent implementation at a national level rests, in my view, with the national institution. Now, when you talk to most ombudsmen and commissioners, and this may be somewhat dated, there is a much younger commissioner coming after me to speak later on. Um, I, it was 2003 when I was appointed. But when we were appointed, we were a small group, um, a small group of institutions. Now in Enoch, there are 44 institutions across the Council of Europe member states. The European Commission is the economic union, and then the Council of Europe is the human rights engine of the region. And those institutions got together back in 1997 and have a permanent secretariat since 2008. But you cannot, for me, as somebody who's in the role for eight, for 11 years, I beg your pardon, you cannot overstate the value of linking in with people outside of your jurisdiction. Because while everything is good um, and everybody's praising you and everybody appears to support the advancement of children's rights, there are often occasions where you come across difficult areas in particular, the interface of parental responsibility and whether children and children's rights are subordinate to parental parents. And any of those difficult areas like international protection or children in, in detention, those are the times when as an institution or as an ombudsman, you often feel isolated on your own. And that is when the institutions in other jurisdictions will come together to work together in in a closer way, you have BINOP, which is the British and Irish network of ombudsmen and commissioners for children. And we established that back in 2004 when there were only, I think, three of us at the time, um, then Scotland, then the UK. And it has developed and evolved into a much stronger institution. But at that time, it was very much around sharing the learning, sharing practices. We were all doing something very, very new in each of our jurisdictions. But what we did have in common was we were all working in common law jurisdictions with very similar administrative systems. So it lent itself to sharing practices that might work or certainly could be replicated in each other's jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Um, just to, quickly to the, to the limits, I'm conscious of time here, just to say for the 11 years that I worked there, there were many, many cases and many occasions where we tried to do what Ursula referred to as own volition, systemic investigations, in the same way that as lawyers choose strategic litigation, you choose a case that will have a greater effect for many, many children in terms of outcome. But one of the two of the big limitations, the first is in relation to intervention as a third party in the court. There's no power in Ireland for the Ombudsman to, to litigate as a third party, which is a real shame because it has been used by the national human rights institutions to great effect. And it would be, it would be a hugely um, strengthening of the institution to add that power. The second is that there were very key exclusions for children, namely private institutions, police powers, which is where I am now, and then matters before the courts. So there are plenty of places, not least the digital, space for children um, that are exempt from the investigation of ombudsman for children. And when children's lives and children's time is spent in those spaces, it's really critical that institutions that have oversight of children's rights should be given that kind of remit. In terms of achievements, um, we're not huge at um, blowing our own trumpets in Ireland, but I have four points here. One is about the institution itself has grown in great strength as an institution. When I started, we had 20 staff. Niall Muldoon, who's the current Ombudsman for Children, now has 40 staff and an increased budget, um, both in terms of financial and human resource. In terms of examples of achievements, Ursula has referred to some, I've referred to others. Just to quickly summarize, constitutional change, 
legislative change in terms of child protection and adoption, policy change for children seeking international protection and children detained in prison. In terms of the awareness of children's rights, Ursula referred to the piece of work that we did called the Big Ballot, which was really a foundation piece, raising awareness of the institution across Ireland and letting people know that we were there and that we were on our way. And lastly, the use of the soft power. So there are all the creative things that we have done, whether it's collaborating with art galleries, with artists, with musicians, in ways that children might engage themselves and enjoy. And I will lastly just mention NGOs and civil society, because that has been really critical to occasions when as an ombudsman, you're not the right voice or you're not the right person to say it. That's when your civil society and your NGO groups come and work together and collaborate in the greater interests of advancing children's rights. Thank you. Thank you to Ursula and Emily. Um, right now I'm gonna introduce uh, Bruce Adamson. Uh, Bruce is the Children and Young People's Commissioner of Scotland. He has worked as a human rights expert for the UN, the Council of Europe, the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and as a UN representative for the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. Very glad he could be here. Um, over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian, and, and good to, to see everyone and join you. I really want to build on what Ursula and Emily were saying there with some examples from Scotland. If we could move to the first slide, please. Um, I've got the best job in the world as the Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland. Uh, it's my job to promote and safeguard the rights of the million plus children across Scotland, everyone up to the age of 18 or up to 21. And very similar to what we're hearing in relation to Ireland, um, the Scottish Parliament, when it was created, put great emphasis on the need to follow international best practice to create an independent, high profile and influential position to ensure that relentless pressure on ensuring the implementation of children's rights. Um, if we move to the, the next slide, please. Um, our legislation here in Scotland uh, doesn't have that ombuds function like, like in Ireland, but, but is a, a classic commissioner model. So a strong focus on promoting and safeguarding children's rights, raising awareness of rights, having children and young people at the heart of everything we do, reviewing law policy and practice, and also promoting good practice where we find it. And if we move to the next slide, please. Um, when I got this role five and a half years ago, I traveled around Scotland and asked children and young people what they wanted from their commissioner. Um, always talk to children and young people about the fact that, that they're my boss, the, the role at the heart of it needs to be about involving children and young people. And they came up with lots of really interesting ideas. We talked about how the budget should be spent. We talked about how I and my staff should spend our time, the, the language that we should use, how we should dress was really interesting as well. Um, if we move to the, the next slide, these were some of the things that some of the young people and children said. They said that some of the characteristics were things like being generous and stubborn and loud. They talked about coming to their communities to find out what was important to them. Um, you'll see in the, the top right corner of the, the display there, um, up in Shetland, which is in the north of Scotland, they said they wanted me to be savage in holding those in power to account and standing up for children's rights, which I think reflects the, the Viking heritage there. Um, if we could jump back one slide, please, if that's possible. Um, just down the bottom there was the creation that came out of that of a group of young advisors. And so this has been right at the heart of our work in Scotland is that we have young advisors within our office and they help us develop the strategic plan. They also help us come up with our core values. And so if we jump forward two slides, one of the things that they helped us develop was organizational values. And you'll see there the strong commitment to independence, the strong commitment to bravery, and the strong commitment to participation alongside leadership and respect. And I think that's absolutely essential in terms of protecting that independence, but recognizing that savage or relentless, as, as Emily referred to it, um, obligation to, to stand up for children and young people, but not just stand up for children and young people, also amplify their voice. And if we move to the, the next slide, this is kind of a representation of how I spend my day. Um, sometimes I'm out and about in schools and things. Um, I get to sing a lot, I get to dance a lot, I get to play with, with Lego and find out what's really important to children and young people. But then we take that information, we take that power, and we take it to places where decisions are made. 
And if we move to the, the next slide, one of the key things that's been part of our work has been developing children's understanding of their rights, but also their role as child human rights defenders. And uh, linked to the Committee on the Rights of the Child Day of General Discussion back in, uh, in 2018, uh, which was on child human rights defenders. This has been a really core part of our work. And the group of young human rights defenders that we worked with as our young advisors actually laid a report before the Scottish Parliament with key recommendations around what needed to be done in Scotland to create a culture that supported child human rights defenders, that they had the, the information, education, support and protection that allowed them to be effective human rights defenders. One of our young advisors um, was just in... in um, and for lunch then, one of the former young advisors who's now gone on just finishing university was actually in uh, just a few minutes ago. And I was telling her about the fact that I'd be talking about, about her work. And I think that's really important as well, that we've created a really strong alumni here as well. And that that work continues, because if we move to the, the next slide, um, a really strong focus has been around the, the right to protest. And, and one of the things uh, we've had got COP27 happening um, at the moment, but COP26 happened in, in Glasgow, and there was a really strong focus about the fact that children and young people have been at the forefront of being environmental human rights defenders. And so lots of work around what not just participation looks like for children and young people, but also what, what protest looks like. And I think my, my colleague, uh, Maria Galli, um, who's currently working in Jersey, I think is on the call, and, and she was very involved in this work as well around how we support children and young people to protest and to challenge. And I think that's a really important role of commissioners as well. We wrote to directors of education around the country, really reinforcing the idea that the right and purpose of education involves knowing about your rights and being able to exercise them, even when that involves protest. I want to touch um, on some of the, the key strategic pieces of work that we've done. And so if we move to the next slide, one of my biggest concerns when I became commissioner was that Scotland was one of the very few countries in, in Europe and decreasing globally that still allowed for the legal physical punishment of children within family settings. And so I think this was a really good example of where we worked very, very closely with research colleagues, with a broad array of civil society colleagues, and really campaigned very strongly for a change to the law in Scotland to ensure comprehensive legal protection against physical punishment. Um, it had been one of the issues that, that the first commissioner back in 2004 had been working on, but we'd not been able to make the progress. And over recent years, we were able to bring together international colleagues. We had the Commissioner for, for Human Rights from the Council of Europe get directly involved. We had the Committee on the Rights of the Child get directly involved and really pushing for that change and managed to secure that legislative change. And the role of the Commissioner's Office, um, reflecting back on, on the former Commissioners as well, was seen essential in the leadership of securing that change. But if we move on to the, the next slide, it's perhaps a useful example of where some of the limits of the power of independent children's rights institutions can be. Because one of the other abject failures in Scotland was that we had an age of criminal responsibility of just eight years old, so the lowest in the world. And despite significant campaigning in very, very similar ways to what we were doing on equal protection, we were unable to secure a raise of the age of criminal responsibility above 12. We managed to get it from eight to 12 but we could get it no further than 12. Again, we, we undertook exactly the same approach. We, we brought in research, we brought in a broad coalition of civil society, we used all of our powers, we were writing legal journals, we were suggesting legal challenges, um, but we were unable to secure the political support. And so I think that's a really interesting example of even when you're doing everything that you possibly can, uh, sometimes there, there are limits to the soft powers that we have. And so Scotland still has an age of criminal responsibility of just 12. And we also have children um, at 16 and 17 in our prison system, um, which, which government has agreed to change, but, but very slowly. And so that's probably a, a useful example of some of the limits of, of power where there's still political discretion. Um, moving to the, the next slide, I want to focus on the specific legal powers that we have. And so the 
Children's Commission here in Scotland has specific investigation powers where we can compel evidence and report to Parliament. And we did our first investigation in relation to restraint and seclusion within education settings. And the report that came out of that work, which was done very closely with children and young people and their families, made a, a significant number of recommendations, 22, and actually led to, to significant change across Scotland. So using those sharp legal powers, um, are very important because this had been an issue that families have been campaigning on for um, for decades and made no progress and it was through the use of our investigation powers that we were able to make progress and if we move to the next slide strategic litigation is another core power um, emily spoke about some of the the limits in, in the irish legislation in terms of being able to, to take cases um, we have no uh, statutory power to be involved in strategic litigation, we, but we developed a uh, program of strategic litigation, which relied on just using the, the court's discretion to become a third party. And so we've taken a number of cases on no recourse to public funds, on deprivation of liberty, and on restraint and seclusion, following up our investigation. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that the court was very receptive to that, us acting in kind of amicus curiae, um, but what's even better is that uh, through some legislative change which is coming in Scotland, we'll have that power put on a statutory footing and uh, gain a new power to take cases in our own name, which is, is hugely important. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, COVID, it would be remiss of me not to focus on the fact that, that COVID has been one of the biggest human rights challenges to children reflect there that very early on the Committee on the Rights of the Child called on states to take a rights-based approach to the pandemic. Um, in Scotland there was a real failure to do that and our response was to get involved in, in every aspect of it. We know that COVID disproportionately affected those whose rights were already most at risk and so what we did is we undertook an independent children's rights impact assessment to try and demonstrate to government and other decision makers the need to take a rights-based approach and how decisions would, would be different. And I think that's been a really powerful piece of work because I think it's really shown the failure to take a rights-based approach, particularly in relation to the involvement of children and young people, has had a devastating effect, which, which is ongoing. Um, and it links into some of our other kind of key priority areas of work, such as poverty and mental health, which were the biggest issues raised by children and young people prior to the pandemic and have been significantly exacerbated, particularly for those groups of children whose rights were already most at risk. Um, I'll move on to the, the next slide, which touches upon um, the international connection and um, the sharp eye of you may notice there's a typo because there's now 43 members of the European Network of Ombudspersons for Children. Um, and I know colleagues from Enoch are on the call, including from, from the Secretariat. And so I would like to thank them uh, for the incredible work that's done at Enoch. And I think I would, would strongly reiterate the point that Emily made about the importance of solidarity and support and joint working across Europe. It's, it's incredibly powerful. And again, Emily, I think, touched upon very well the Council of Europe and the European Union as important drivers for, for change in terms of children's rights. Despite Scotland not currently being a member of, of the European Union, it's still an important part. And again, I think Emily covered very well the, the importance of UN reporting, particularly in relation to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the really important elements of ENOC is our ENIA work. So this is, this is the European network of young advisors. And again, I, I think the, the former coordinator of the European network of young advisors is actually on the call as well. It's, it's, um, it's great to see so much of the Enoch family involved. Um, the young advisors are from across the Enoch network and each year they set up a parallel and, um, and complementary program to the work that we're doing on thematic issues. And so the representation on the screen goes back to the uh, work that was done and led by, uh, by Greece on COVID, um, but we've more recently worked on rights in relation to the environment, and the current piece of work is on exactly the topic of discussion today on the role of independent children's rights institutions. But um, as we have the, the strong connection of young people, young advisors domestically, we, re we reflect that at the European level as well. So the work of the European Network of Ombudsbursts for Children is reflected also in the work um, of, of Enoch. So, so that, that's a really important point as well. Um, 
we move to the, the next slide, I just want to touch upon some of the other engagement with the UN. Uh, here is uh, Katrina and EJ, so two of our young advisors, and they were actually engaging with the Committee Against Torture. And so I think the, the work of the Committee on the Rights of the Child is hugely important, but actually this was the first time that young people led a delegation to the Committee Against Torture, and there's huge amounts of work we need to do to support children to engage in the wider UN system. If we move to the next slide, this is the former Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty in Glasgow, working directly with children on poverty, and then some of those children going to the UN, to the Human Rights Council to support that work, and I think that's really important. If we move on, just as I come to, to my last substantive point, um, incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is absolutely essential. Um, we now have legislation that's been passed by the, the Scottish Parliament, but does need reconsideration, um, which fully and directly incorporates the Convention of the Rights of the Child into our domestic law and gives new power to our office. And that's gonna be a real game changer. And if we move to, to my last slide, the reason why that's so important, and this was reflected by a piece of work we did for the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where we asked children and young people to tell us why children's rights and why rights and law mattered so much to them. And they were given just seven words to do that. And again, I think for those of us that take longer to say things than we need to, it's a useful exercise to try and come up with something that's just seven words. And they came up with things like rights matter, you matter, don't lose hope. Freedom from poverty helps all children flourish. Rights are my armor to me. Rights are protection before you even ask. And also, um, we have rights, dinosaurs don't, they died, which I think opens up in all sorts of fantastic discussions about the environment and about what rights mean. I think some of the most fun conversations I've had have been about whether zombies have rights or aliens have rights. And I think these type of creative things are really at the heart of what we do. And so, I'll finish just by saying that this is the best job in the world. Um, and that's partly because of the work that we do internationally and the solidarity and the discussions we're having today, but it's mostly because of the incredible privilege that we have to work directly with children and young people in creative ways. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, before I introduce Agnes, I um, wanna reiterate what he mentioned that it's fantastic to see so many people here, especially um, colleagues from Enoch, uh, the Hope for Children CRC Policy Center. And I've noticed some uh, collaborators to this book um, are also here, so we're very happy to have them. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Agnes Lux. Agnes is a research fellow with the Center for Social Sciences in Hungary. Um, she worked in the Hungarian Office of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights, the Amundsman. She also worked as a child rights education and Adv Advocacy Director of UNICEF Hungary. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed collaborating with Agnes on editing this book, um, other projects as well. Um, and uh, Agnes is gonna talk about uh, her contribution to this book. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Brian, and, and I'm very happy to be here, basically, and, and let me very welcome, partly from uh, the organizing uh, organ, Center for Social Sciences, or audience, and thanks for Schubert Center for this wonderful job what we have done, and I just joined Bruce because uh, I also had the best job ever when, when we worked with you, basically, with Brian, uh, to 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 develop this this wonderful book so i really hope that lots of the people can 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 learn more about your experiences so uh, so we are very happy uh, to have authors of, of the book um, here with me um uh, so let's uh, let's talk about the Hungarian Ombudsman's role and activity, um, not as a general one, but related to the UN Convention's four guiding principles, um, which I analyzed in this chapter. Uh, I could be, I think, uh, even more objective and critical a bit, as as I'm now a researcher and not a, an active uh, participant in the work of the ombudsman. But it was quite hard to have a critical lens uh, on me. But I try to to analyze the the guiding principles in the Hung Hungarian ombudsman's activities, especially in the last three ombudsmen, so since more or less 2013. So the next slide, please. 
Um, why does Hungary need an ICRI? This is my first question, but and I need to also to uh, clarify that we have uh, basically a general ombudsman institution, which is a national human rights institution too. So it's not an ICRI in a in a traditional sense, but an NHRI. And um, before I go into the institution detail, I just uh, a few words about Hungary because Hungary is a very tiny. Uh, little country in the heart of Central Europe with 10 million uh, people, which is roughly uh, like North Carolina. So it's not a big one. So you can somehow uh, scale Hungary's size and, and population within the US dimension. Uh, it, it will be Im important to note uh, when we are talking about the number of complaints uh, submitted to the, to the Ombudsman Institution. So Hungary, uh, and as a as a post-communist country within that region, was one of the first who ratified the UNCRC back in the days in 1990, and it's a very important uh, milestone, I think, in the in the field of children's rights in in Hungary because it was a first step, uh, which basically guide us when we are talking about child rights and child protection here in Hungary, not only in the dimension of the ombudsman, but in general. So it's important that we have a, we have a domestic law uh, after the ratification of the UNCRC. So it's, it, UNCRC became an, uh, uh, um, a domestic law too in 1991. Um, and about the general ombudsman, so it was basically established the office in 1993, so quite early, uh, with the wide scope of, of defending the human rights. So children's rights was not uh, listed among the uh, among the priorities of the ombudsman. The children's rights became uh, as a legal obligation uh, to defend of the ombudsman as part of the Child Protection Act. A couple of years after the, the, the Ombudsman Act was established. So we didn't have a, a kind of legislation which named the, uh, the obligation to defend the children's rights. And we didn't have before a deputy or a specialized Ombudsman. So it was uh, like a Swedish model type um, Ombudsman institution. Uh, so with a quite wide scope of, of defending the human rights and uh, examining the maladministration or the dysfunction of administration. So this was the, and, and still it is the, the most important part of the task of the Ombudsman. And at uh, that time, the, the general one, so the parliamentary commissioner uh, had basically three other um, specialized ombudsman, one for the national minorities, one for data protection, and one for um, uh, for the future generation, the interest of future generation. But it's quite tricky because it not uh, it was not a children's rights ombudsman. He was working and still he is working as a deputy um, in the field of and questions of right to environment. So it's a kind of green ombudsman. Uh, and the legislation was changed in 2012, when the time the new constitution, a new fundamental law uh, was uh, accepted by the parliament and also along with the new constitution, a new Ombudsman Act entered into force. And um, the legislature that time opted for an integrated institution. So, I think it, he's missed the opportunity to set up a specialized uh, ombudsman or a specialized deputy for defending the children's rights. The only thing what we can be happy with that the defense of children's rights has become one of the legal obligation of the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights since 2012. So it was an important step made by the legislature to at least to name as a priority of the uh, of the task of the ombudsman, but or other I can be said uh, in that sense that it's a missed opportunity that uh, there was no deputy set up. So currently we have a general ombudsman or still we have, and then we have two deputies, one for the future generations interests and one for the national minorities. 
I will talk about later that uh, this is quite interesting in a question of uh, children belonging to, to minorities, especially to Roma communities, which is a quite, quite an issue in Hungary. So they have to work in, together in that field. And um, in, 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 uh, in general, I can, I can tell you that the Ombudsman is vested with the quasi-judicial competence to hear and consider complaints against uh, public authorities or public service providers. So with, in, in the field of the children's rights, the ombudsman can um, initiate an investigation towards, uh, for example, um, a maintainer of, of a school or a children's home or um, um, kind of um, closed institutions or against the police and, and, and so on and so on. But we have a quite limited competence when we are talking about the the, the quasi-judicial uh, field of the of the ombudsman. Uh, what is also important, and I mentioned that the ombudsman, so we don't have an ICRI, but we have a national human rights institution. So the, the commissioner applied to, to be one. So in Hungary, the ombudsman is the NHRI. Firstly, it was um, accepted that we had the A status, so the full harmony with the UN Paris principles, and it was a big, um, result, I think, and and then all all of us were very happy with this uh, with this with this um, uh, outcome of of the uh, Geneva based uh, accreditation. So we have uh, this uh, this this task basically, and unfortunately, as the last day uh, or the tendency of the last years, it, it resulted that we are downgraded now to status B. I will also talk about later, but firstly, we had the A status with fully compliance with the UN Paris principles. So it, it ensured the independence and different uh, conditions we fulfilled in the, in the questions of children's rights too. Uh, all right, the next slide, please. Yes, and uh, during this analysis, uh, it's uh, quite easy to to grab the the focuses of the ombudsman's work when we are to, when we try to 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 start with the whole child model or the whole child approach. I chosen that one because the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child has these four guiding principles, uh, which can be seen also as analyzable elements of an ICRI. And, and it was uh, basically shown by, by the chapter that, that it could be analyzed. So I just check the, the, uh, the enforcement and implementation of the right to, the right to life, uh, the, the non-discrimination, the right to participation and the best interests of the child as, the, as these are the four guiding principles defined by the UNCRC committee, uh, which means that all the children's rights in the UN Convention has to be taken into consideration, of course, and has to be Im implemented, but these four uh, are particularly necessary for the fulfillment of all other rights, so it can be seen, obviously, it's, 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 it's a good start where what we, um, what we analyze uh, in the work of an institution. And the whole child approach is also means that these these rights in the convention are linked to each other and must must be considered as a whole. So it gave me a good frame to analyze the the activities, especially in the last three uh, ombudsmen. And also, I have to tell you what I what I uh, started with that the Hang Hungary is one of the first countries in the region uh, which ratified fully the. Convention, so we have these rights as obligation for us. So all the members uh, here, of the, all, all representatives of authorities, and so on and so on, has to take into consideration these rights and have to implement the the convention. Uh, the next slide, please. So what we, when we see the the four big um, issues, uh, I found that the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights uh, in the field of right to life and, and development, um, for, uh, in one part, I checked the complaints and the number of complaints, the type of the complaints which are related to children's rights. And when we see the, gen, the, the, the entire number of complaints which the uh, office received per year, it's approximately 7,000 and 8,000 complaints per year. 
that's why I mentioned to you it's important to note that we are a quite tiny country with 10 million people. Uh, so it's yeah, it's a, it's a quite high number, let's say, um, for an office to be submitted. And based on the statistics, we could see that oh, approximately 10 percentage of all cases have been related to children's rights in one or another sense. And um, however, there is no official uh, data on the age of the complainant. So it could be also a, a way to improve the child friendliness of the institution uh, to have a better, better understanding of the complainants. But uh, we can see that there are quite low number of the complaints submitted directly by children. And of course, it's not a Hungarian um, special feature because as, uh, as the researcher shows us that um the the the, the children not uh, really complaining on turning directly to an to an institution like the ombudsman uh, but we have to do more efforts and i think that bruce and emily was wonderful in not only in the presentation but also in the in my experience about them that uh, how can be more visible more active more effective an institution so it's uh, they are really role models for us so we have to move in that way uh, much more. So we have to also maybe develop a child-friendly mode for easily submitting the complaints and so on, because in the Hungarian case, anyone can turn to the ombudsman. There is no obligation how to do that um, complaint. There is no uh, strict format. So in theory, everyone, it's a quite easy way to send an email or just have a phone call. But without visibility, without promotion of the institution, without the weapon of the publicity is really, um, it's, it's not very usual that the, uh, that the children turn to the, to the office. Okay, um, and uh, the right to life is a, an, under the uh, scope of the Ombudsman that he is working as a, an OPCAT national preventive mechanism. So um, perform the task of the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. So he visits regularly a closed in institution where children also can be kept like uh, detention centers or uh, homes for children or disability homes and so on and so on. The best interest of the child uh, serves as a focus on on-site investigation, also based on the Child Protection Act, on based on the UNCRC, which clearly said this is an obligation for all authorities. Um, the child participation is a quiet, challenging part of the activity of the Ombudsman because it's no uh, institutionalized way of participation uh, developed yet. There were sporadic projects, for example, the Deputy of National Minorities ran through uh, two Council of Europe projects with Roma and non-Roma students um, being involved in, in discussion, but they, they were absolutely uh, sporadic in a couple of years ago. And the non-discrimination is the fourth field what I analyzed, and it's um, it's an issue which is divided uh, in the nation in the in the uh, question of investigation and, and handling the complaints with the deputy for national minorities. So they can be more active in that field. And however, there are also European Court of Human Rights judgments related to uh, segregation against Roma children and so on, which are issues and hard issues in Hungary because it's an issue, the, the challenges of the Roma children here. The, Offices are not that loud in that sense, I can tell you. Um, and we need to uh, put also attention to other vulnerable groups like uh, LGBTQI children, migrant children, which can, in that field, we can feel the um, the, the the cautiousness of the of the institution, and and it's it's a hard, quite challenging to uh, to, to fulfill uh, defense of children's rights when we are silent in these uh, issues which are in the political debate. And the last slide, and I will be wrap up very uh, quickly. Thank you. Uh, so the challenge is what we have now that we, the Ombudsman Institution was downgraded from NHRI A status to B with the critics that uh, they uh, don't give uh, enough attention to different uh, field of human rights, like the LGBT people, like the migrant children's issues and so on. Uh, there is no meaningful child participation, which is uh, absolutely a big lack for 
year, many years now. And we can see also uh, uh, very highly dropping activities since 2013. And I think that if a performance uh, of a public institution is clearly affected by public and political attitude towards children, we need to be uh, not only an office as an institution, but we need to have face like Emily, like Bruce, like everyone who want to who want to really be a a, a, a mouthpiece of of this uh, of of the children's issues, and I think it's still a missing one. Yeah, and I wrap up. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm here in the Q and A session. Thank you, Agnes. Um, I'm grateful to Professor Carl Hansen for serving as today's discussant. Carl is. Professor of Law and Director of the University of Geneva's Center for Children's Rights Studies. He's the Program Director of the Master of Advanced Studies in Children's Rights and Chair of the Steering Committee of the Children's Rights European Academic Network. Um, along with Patrick Thomas, Carl and I maintain a long-term interest in studying children's ombudspersons. Um, I turn it over to Carl and thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, Brian, for and for this invitation and also congratulations to you and Agnes, I think. First, because I think you both are, are the reason why we are gathering today. I mean, you've compiled this wonderful book on the roles of independent children's rights institutions in advancing human rights of children. And I think this webinar is just gives, gives us a glimpse of the, of the density and of the richness of the book. And I really wanted to, to congratulate you with that. And indeed, Brian, it goes back to, to this, this longstanding ambition uh, that we had. And I, I, I quote also from your introduction uh, to the book, it's the importance of advancing knowledge on independent human rights uh, institutions for children, the I Christ, or well, the ombuds, as we might call them all together. And I think there's so many questions we could ask, so I can only concentrate on a few. And in this panel, we have a, a short time, but I'll come back to a few topics on which I think I, I would would be glad to to uh, to see a discussion amongst us. But maybe first to situate it further, the questions we can ask, or the kind of questions we can engage with, are but I do think we are at a time now in history where we, can, where we can ask empirical questions. Like many of these questions are answered in the chapters also in the book. What, what are these ombuds for children or these independent institutions? Why have they been set up? What are their powers? Can we compare them? So all these very interesting questions, and I think a lot of them have also been brought up uh, during the presentations we've just heard. But you can also ask also these uh, empirical questions. You can also ask uh, quite some normative questions also like, well, do we need them? Does the international legal framework, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, does it oblige states to have one? Uh, but also another other side is what to do with them in federal states. I had a chance to travel between Belgium and Switzerland, which are two federal states, and it is not so easy. And I see also like in the context of the UK, how, how to really put them and, and the normative framework where to, where to situate them in this legal field might be complicated. But then we also ask evaluative questions. And I think a lot of the politicians, if they would be following us, I doubt if there are many, but if they would, would ask questions like, well, but tell me, why would I spend my money on an ombuds? Are they, do, they ha do they have some impact? Is it worthwhile? Can we, well, is it really worthwhile to have them? Because of course my resources are limited. So if you want me to spend them on an ombuds, is that, well, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the concrete effect? And also, and that's a bit one of the points I like to, to I would say, uh, engage with. There's also many theoretical questions, I think, that are interesting around what, what's this kind of uh, bizarre institution? We had the trias politicus, we had the legislators, the judge, judges, and, um, and the administration or the executive. And now we have something in between, there's like a fourth level. And so, where do we put it? And how can we understand these ombuds? So on these different levels, we can continue engaging with questions. And again, I thank you uh, and congratulate you, Agnes and Brian, for having compiled this book that brings us along in all those different directions. Now, for for the for the for the for the panel, I'd like to take us to to three topics. The one is on independence, another one is on representation, and the last one is on the translation between the international and the national level. But for, so my first topic goes on independence. And of course, you all mentioned it, I think uh, Bruce said, uh, we are independent. Uh, in, also in, 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 the, in the compilation of text, like uh, the author who writes on Pakistan speaks about the suo motu powers. And I think also in, in uh, well, and, uh, Agnes, you spoke about 
the, well, the, the definition itself of an eye crease and independence. So we speak about that. And uh, also in Ireland, we had this own volition investigations. And so all of this speaks about these suomotu powers. You have an independent power. And I would, uh, well, my, my question is, is, a, is one where I'm wondering, could you give some further examples of where uh, these ombuds that you have been or Emily or that we have studied or that you actually are like Bruce, is there examples of, of where you, you have had the idea, this was me, my institution, we have put this independently on the agenda. So the, could you give examples? And of course there are limits to it. We had also examples of the limits of soft power of its impact, but just give us some further ideas of, of, of where does that lead us to? That would be my, my first round of, of questions. I don't know who wants, and it's open. I mean, if you want to take the floor, please go ahead. Bruce, do you want to respond? Absolutely. Um, I think independence is, is, is absolutely key. And, and here in Scotland, uh, where I'm appointed by the head of state, uh, the uh, our late queen on nomination of the Scottish Parliament and operate entirely independent of government. So I have no legal relationship with government. Um, and so a lot of that work then is working with children and young people to try and set the agenda. But to be honest, most of our work is quite reactive to the government's mm -hmm. agenda. But, but some really clear examples would be the one that I used earlier on physical punishment, where the government had no interest in bringing that forward. It wasn't politically popular. And it was actually us working with an opposition member um, from the Green Party in the parliament that that, that went forward. It, it wasn't the government initiative and the government opposed it. Um, until quite late in the process when they realized that they would they would lose that and so that was a really good example of us working with civil society and children and young people to bring forward an essential legal reform which the government opposed um, the less successful one with age and responsibility and incorporation of the CRC as well um, that's been a civil society campaign working with children and young people which the government opposed um, over a very, very long time and only quite recently came on, on board with it. So you do need to convince government eventually, mm -hmm. but, but generally when we're setting the agenda, it's by building up a strong evidence base, by uh, encouraging child human rights defenders to really lead the process and to build up civil society partnerships using the media um, to try and really challenge government. Yeah. And, and that's how we, we've, we've got some of those things onto the agenda. And you, uh, Emily and, and Ursula, are you for Ireland? Is, are there, I think, I'm, well, so we had this, this topic, so physical punishment was something put on the agenda, like the agenda setting, because that's part of the, I would say, the independence power. Do you have examples where you've succeeded in at least having people talk about a topic, which without the institution would have never made it to the agenda? Emily, you're <laughs> My goodness, three years in, you think, <laughs> you think I'd remember the old mute button. Um, yes, thanks, Carl. We are also institutionally independent and Paris principle compliant, so that accountability is directly to Parliament. And when that matters is, is like Bruce said, when government are unwilling to advance something, and that generally happens when the issue itself is not popular with voters. So for us in Ireland, it was children in detention, in particular children in prisons. There was a plan, but it wasn't moving. We couldn't hear children's voices. It was outside of the remit of the institutions. So the most creative thing we did was to go in and speak to 35 young teenage boys between the ages of 16 and 18 to find out their experience. That then went to the UN Committee Against Torture. So like Bruce, not necessarily the traditional uh, pathway of the UNCRC, but the UNCAT, who internationally then um, brought, I suppose, the kind of shame on uh, the Irish society and government for its treatment of children um, in institutions. Change at constitutional level was very much, it was unpopular politically. Mm -hmm. um, they did not want to, they were certainly were not receptive in the very beginning to that. Um, that became um, if I'm to be honest about it, a personal <laughs> obsession. And sometimes there are things that you feel very strongly about. It Again, like Bruce said, it began as a civil society. Um, it emerged as a civil society debate. It was taken up by one of our um, now retired Supreme Court justices, but it was really accelerated, I think, um, by ourselves in the Ombudsman for Children's Office. But I do remember getting quietly and informally 
getting political backlash for the work that I was doing, you know, being taken aside at events and getting an earful from politicians. They won't do it publicly, but they will say to you, what, what you know, you know, you really need to stop what you're doing. So there's, that's there are those moments are the moments when you know that you're actually making some kind of progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when you say, yes, I've, I was successful when they put you in a corner yes. wanting to discuss something <laughs> private with you, which is quite challenging, I guess, mm. as a job. Ursula, did you, because I think you, you own, you use the, this nice word of own volition, like on the investigative powers, are there, on, on what kind of topics would an ombudsman then use his or her own volition, this, this autonomy from deciding on what to put your resources and your time and yeah, and look, this is the ultimate question, the, the latter part of what you've just said, Karen, of how do you decide what, how, to, how to use your limited power and your limited resources to maximum effect? And I think what, what our experience would show is that uh, you gather all that information, uh, intelligence and evidence uh, systematically over a period of time and either look, look to use the unvolition power on matters that are, that are of grave concern uh, or a widespread concern. And I think probably child protection fell into both of those categories, really. Um, and I think, I'm not sure if it fell into this express category, but certainly the whole area of, of, of uh, children in, in our system of direct provision uh, in terms of separated children and what could be galvanized uh, through, through the good offices of the ombudsman. Um, I think that was a really interesting exercise of that authority. So using the that soft power to bring people together, you know, and, and I have a more recent example of that where um, the, the current office wrote uh, asking questions about a particular area of interest um, and, and the response was that they would use the office to bring people together. So using that authority and, and, um, and um, the identity of the office uh, to, to effect change collaboratively, I think is a really interesting um, model. So. And I think what, what we found also is that some of the some of the powers it's certainly sometimes different, different, difficult to say which precise power is being used. And some of that is is a really um, creative response to using the integrity of the office um, in those really important ways. May I turn to, to Agnes, but maybe it's it's a political difficult question, or at least as a within the within Europe, we see Hungary which is under threat, under pressure. It is not a, a government, I guess, that is very friendly towards having independent human rights watchdogs in-house. I mean, uh, how, how is that in a, in a country where things are a bit more, I would say, well, or at the least from, from the outside where you could see that this is not easy, or this must certainly not be easy to uphold this idea of independence vis-a-vis -a, -vis a government in general that is not so uh, human rights oriented for the least, if that's the least I could say. Yes, I don't know, Carla, why do you think that it's hard? <laughs> oh, I just happened to think that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just a joke. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's challenging. But uh, I, I um, so when I when I uh, thinking back, so the the Ombudsman Institution was always um, seen by the public or the, by the political elite like a soap in the eye, let's say, because uh, when I just look back to the time of 2009 and, and 15, so a bit earlier, uh, the parliamentary plen plenary didn't didn't hear to the ombudsman uh, so you know he submitted the annual uh, uh, yearbook uh, to, to the parliament and there was no debate uh, no plenary debate they just decided not to discuss it for long long years because they had some problems with uh, with uh, some words of the ombudsman that time and he his office was not renewed so uh, yeah, officially and formally and legally and in a normative way, it, the, the, all the um, guarantees of independence is there, but, mm -hmm. but still it's, it's, he's part of the political game and, and, and it is. And now in the, in the current situation, I just l let me illustrate with one thing that the Amnesty International in Hungary just ran a campaign uh, with the with a photo of the commissioner, uh, like in the missing children of the milk box, you know, uh, milk uh, box in the US. Do, do you know what, what I mean? So, uh, and, and, and they ran the campaign that, have you seen this guy? So, because 
<laughs> he's been like an in invisible one. And however, yeah. the, the staff is working there hard, the complaints are submitted to the Ombudsman institution still, and they are running investigations, but no one knows. It's okay, it's a bit, you know, sharply saying, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's challenging yeah, it's and it's a, it's a part of the game. Brian, could you, I'm, I'm turning to you, Brian, just, is there anything more general because we have several themes and we, we do need to, I think by itself, the, the notion of independence, we could spend a whole webinar, I guess, on, on how that works out and where it comes from. But maybe, do you have any general ideas about your connections with members of VNOC and widely spoken, this whole idea of independent national human rights institutions for children and how, what are the stakes today with the independence? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, one of the chapters in the book is with Robin Shura on independence. Mm -hmm. Robin and I are working with a, uh, someone named Michelle Gatto uh, on this um, project around independence. Um, we find when we look at independence, there are different components of independence. Um, and so we're trying to map that out across Enoch institutions, um, different aspects instead of just one word about independence. The other thing I would say from um, research, and, and this is true of our projects with you, Carl, um, that uh, it independence matters, as the panelists have said, um, when it when they are speaking up and uh, in a way going against popular opinion or going against political opinion. Um, and that's when it counts a lot, um, um, being able to exert their independence and then their powers to uh, advocate on behalf of young people. Thank you. Okay, if, if, if you don't mind, I wanted to move to the second part, to a second topic, which is the one on, on, on representation. And, and well, so it's, it's a, well, representation, participation. But I start with, with, with what I think uh, Agnes wrote about complaints. So in, in her chapter, she writes that complaints received by children are few. And that's a nice way of saying that. Well, in, uh, I guess it might be, well, Bruce, you might have another status or idea about it as, as, as I understand your institution does not receive direct individual complaints, but as for Ireland and as for, uh, for Hungary. So, and well, I, I know it also from previous uh, work, literature, discussions with people that, so ombudspersons who have this function of receiving individual complaints, and that is then meant for children and young people because that's what the institution is about. In reality, they receive the, the vast majority of complaints is not by people under 18, but it is by adults speaking on their behalf. I have a few questions about that. Maybe, maybe that is not a problem. So my first question is, do you think that is a problem? Maybe, I'm, maybe that is just normal. And, and is there a way of how can you explain how that comes? And, and then the, in, I would also say, well, can we do something about it if you think we need to do something about it? Maybe you say that's how it is and we don't need to do something about it. But I might first ask Emily and, and Ursula, who have this, well, in, in Ireland, you have this uh, outspoken and, and as, as the model also, and you know also of, your, of the practices of colleagues who have the similar kind of function to receive individual complaints. Well, our, our youngest uh, complainant was a four-year-old girl with a disability. And we got a very good outcome, an outcome for, essentially she was complaining that she was um, a wheelchair user and was not allowed to get an electric wheelchair until she was seven, because the policy was that not until a child is chronologically seven were they capable of using an electric wheelchair safely. In, in summary, the outcome of that was not for that, in, just that individual child, but she actually changed the policy for everybody. But our experience is, is the same as everybody else. Few children make complaints. If you think of the, the nature of complaints, the construct of complaints is an adult construct. Um, so you can hear when you listen to Bruce, you can get very rich information, rich data from hearing children's views and utilizing Article 12. Um, I found the investigations, I have to say the complaints and investigations very, very useful. Um, but I wouldn't, I would be less worried, Carl. I wouldn't be worried that the complaint has to come from the individual child. Where, where it's a problem is where you have children without parental care or guardians. So children in detention, children in state care, children um, in international protection settings, or any residential setting where they're without a parent or guardian. That's when it becomes problematic. And that's where 
the UN committee has been very strong on this and ombudsmen and commissioners have been very strong to do targeted work with children of least advantage for whom you may need to make greater efforts to hear um, their concerns. So perhaps just reframing that into concerns rather than complaints, you may get the same information that will allow you utilize the power of the institution. Yeah. Agnes, is there something that, well, it was your observation that I took as a starting point. So. Yeah, just, just a few words that, um, so I, I am not sure, of course, that all the all the complaints. Uh, this, so this is the only way when <clears throat> we, we 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 will uh, receive information about children's lives. But but uh, on the other hand, it's an important one. So we need to improve ourselves in that way to to be more child friendly or at least more visible for them. Because uh, but but also Emily said that there are also the possibility to turn to these institution for guardians for child psychologists for different actors who can uh, help and support children and, and also have a signal in their head if there is something went wrong with the child so we need to we, we need to be at least more more visible towards the uh, children yeah i know bruce is just something on, on that notion because well you, you do i i think well as i understand your institution because you don't have these individual complaints you are yourself obliged to reach out to, to young people and children Absolutely. And while we don't take complaints, we, we do receive communication from um, and, and, and we have a, a, a free call line and things. And it has exactly the same experience. The vast majority are, are adults. The, the reason why the Scottish Parliament chose not to follow the Ombuds model is that they argued, I think, wrongly um, that there was already adequate access to justice for, for children because there's a public services Ombuds person and they looked to the court system. But as has been mentioned, um, it's not only that children don't have political rights, it's that complaint systems are designed in a very adult way and, and they don't speak to the way in which, which children want an effective, effective remedy. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a big piece of work around looking at, at, at trying to create effective remedies for, for children and young people. And um, as, as Emily and others have said, when we've used our investigative powers um, or our strategic litigation powers, they've been very targeted on, on children, particularly those that, that don't um, otherwise have an adequate voice. And so restraint and seclusion work, um, many of those children were, were, were non-verbal. Um, the work that we've done around children in detention, we're, we're primarily focused on care experience, children and young people. And so um, part of it is working directly with children and young people to make sure that, that they can be part of the design of achieving uh, an outcome for them and others. And so that's a big part of the, the human rights defenders work that we're, that we're trying to do is to ensure that, that we can actually get some system change because um, adults complaint systems are, are very seldom going to be able to provide an effective remedy for, for, for children. Yeah. We'll see then live with Brian, whether I can get, a, get, get also to my third question or you want me to go to the Kuyo network and I address the... I, I think if it can be brief, yeah. Okay, I'll try to, because I wanted to, well, I start with Ursula with the question. And for me, it's, it's an idea. What, when I read through the book, and so very, it's about the international versus the national level. And when you read through the chapters, the emphasis is very often on the international, how much the Committee on the Rights of the Child, including observations, general comments, they are used as guidelines and they inform the work of national ombudspersons for children. But there is less to see on the opposite. Maybe there was one quote from Bruce who wrote that, that he spoke about the work of the CRC and Enoch has both influenced and been influenced, so that there was a reciprocity. Now that was in Bruce's uh, well text, it was during the pandemic, but a bit further down, Brian, you also write a bit, write on, on the influence Enoch had on the general comment number two, because uh, of course, general comment number two, who asks countries to have an independent ombuds or institution has also been influenced by Enoch itself who helped drafting general comment number two. Or there's also a chapter by uh, Susanna uh, Rutai who, who sees well how, how ombudspersons seek also international support to do then their work nationally. At least there is a, uh, in, in general, in, in, in the literature, you see, of course, it's important that you can rely on international standards that help you do your job nationally. But my question is, do you see also evidence of the opposite? Uh, in my, my opinion, ombuds are very close also to what, li what lives in a country on a national level amongst children, what they think is important. Do you see any examples of ombuds 
putting what they see from children to the committee? And do they influence at one point, like the agenda setting of general comments adopted by the committee? Uh, so, so where it would be really the other way around, where it's not the committee that, well, safeguards or the, 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 the system safeguards what happens locally, but also the reverse. That was, that was my last kind of uh, series of yeah, questions I, I had. Thank, thanks, Carl. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I would kind of just start by saying, I think that the national, the national level is absolutely essential to the implementation of children's rights. That's where the convention mm -hmm. is implemented. It's where children live, they don't live in the international <laughs> community. So I think it's really pivotal. And um, that's why the independent institutions at national level are so important. Um, and in a way, they, they somehow represent that sort of watchdog monitoring body at a national level on behalf of the committee, as it were, um, in some states at least, or in some forms. I think some of the challenges is around the diversity of models that we have, the mix and, and variety, and, um, and certainly that's something we're, we're looking very closely at across Europe at the moment in particular, but also uh, also across um, uh, globally. And, and I suppose, you know, what I would say is you, you pointed to Enoch and other institutions like that having a, an advocacy role at an international level, there's a very powerful case to be made for, from experience of, in, of the independent institution playing a direct role in the whole process of reporting. It's absolutely key mm -hmm. and separate and distinct from that played by, uh, by NGOs, by civil society more broadly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's interesting, I think, case studies to be had there about how well that works together or not. Separate voices or one single voice. Um, and I think the, inf but the influence of it is absolutely clear. Um, I think particularly in hosting the, the rapporteur or from either the committee or from other um, UN bodies when they come to visit nationally, you know, being the representative of the community in a very official way, I think is very important. So I think that relationship is dynamic and plays out in different ways, but is hugely important. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you, Bruce, have any impact on the agenda setting of the committee? <laughs> like, is there a general comment, a day of discussion yeah. where you had the agenda was like on some of the topics that you think were influenced by you or by colleagues at Enoch? Absolutely. And I think we often talk about um, ICRIs or NHRIs as a bridge between the international mm -hmm. community and the domestic implementation. And so it's really key we're bringing those standards to domestic implementation. But it's also really important for us that children's voice, for me, children's voice from Scotland um, and across Europe um, through Enoch um, are part of that decision making. And I think we've seen that at its best through the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which has been very responsive to those voices, both in relation to to country reviews, but also in terms of days of general discussion setting, um, general comment setting, again, on things like the environment, very much driven by, by young people that the current general comment that's being drafted, the need to review the general comment on, um, on child justice. There's been lots and lots of, mm -hmm. of um, examples where, and if you look on Enoch's website, you can see all of the, the statements that we've made and, and you'll see how closely they link in with the international agenda. Where, where, I, think, where I think that there, there's a real gap is in the other treaty bodies and the other, the charter side of, of the UN. While we will see, for example, the Human Rights Council from time to time taking the views of, of children, it's not done systematically and outside of the, the, the Committee on the Rights of the Child. It, it, it's not as good as it could be. And I think there's a real strengthening that needs to be done, recognizing that children have the right to participate on all issues that affect them. So it's not just um, contained within the, the CRC system. And so I think, I think there's a huge piece of work that we need to do about getting children's voices into the whole of the international machinery. And I think um, ICRIs play an absolutely essential role there because of the recognition that the system does give to us. Thanks a lot. Brian, I go to you. Thank Brian, you. So you, you do the Q and A. Yep. Thanks a lot for the. For thank this, you, Carl, uh, and thank you. Conversation. Yeah, um, we have several questions, and hopefully we can get to them. And I, um, I apologize. Uh, one is actually from uh, Linda McDonald, and let me see. Um, Linda, do you want to ask a question uh, to the group before we we switch over to the Q and A that's been posted? Um, we need if you can unmute. unmute. Linda, are you able to? 
Well, let me go to another question while we're waiting um, on, um, on that. Um, Bruce, uh, there was a question posed earlier. If you could um, respond to that, if you still have the question, I think it's been um, from Nick Tark. Yeah. Okay. So this was in relation to, to the age of criminal responsibility only moving to 12 um, and what the government's, government's reasoning for that was. Um, they argued that we already had other mechanisms uh, for uh, that most children were diverted into a, a welfare-based children's hearing system, and that actually that system would would struggle to deal with the most serious cases. But ultimately, it was a political failure, in my view. Um, it's that it's not popular. They didn't want to be seen as um, as weak on on crime, despite significant evidence within Scotland and internationally that it's counterproductive to use the criminal law to address harmful behaviour of children, despite intervention from the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Commissioner for Human Rights. Ah. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Human Rights of the Council of Europe, who were very clear that 14 was the absolute minimum and that you should be looking much higher than that. Um, it was purely a, a political um, decision. And actually they then delayed and put in place some punitive measures in relation to children under 12 in, in terms of collection of their information. So a, a huge amount of sense, although we did secure uh, a review, which is, which is ongoing to, to increase it hopefully in future. Thank you. Uh, Emily, I think Michelle Gatto asked you a question about bodily autonomy, if you wanna respond. Um, you're, you're muted. Michelle asked the question about the liberalisation of abortion laws in Ireland recently and um, the question of LGBTQ rights in relation to bodily autonomy. So I had just said to um, Michelle, there are two things. One is that before the liberalisation of abortion laws came in, Ireland uh, liberalised, if you like, the gender recognition laws. So as Ombudsman for Children, I was asked my opinion back in 2013. So I've sent a link to you, Michelle. Um, on the submission to Parliament in relation to gender recognition. And that went through our Parliament and was passed in 2015. And then the abortion law followed that. What was interesting there is I discussed this matter with the current Ombudsman for Children, because for some reason in Ireland, people weren't, weren't able to take the fact that the Ombudsman for Children might uh, advocate in the context of uh, an, a liberalization of abortion context. So I, at that stage, I was Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission, and we agreed that I would do it under the, national, under the banner of the National Human Rights Institution. So in our submission, we covered the fact that there are 300 teenage girls a year that were uh, traveling to the UK uh, for abortion. So the, the issue of uh, bodily autonomy for children was covered by the National Human Rights Institution at the time. But just to mention that gender recognition was also um, and I've sent that link, I think I've sent that link to Michelle. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandrine asks, and then we'll um, go to the other ones, about advancing children's rights policies or programs in developing countries, uh, for instance, Africa. I'll, I'll just respond quickly. There is, um, it's a great question. There's an African charter on the rights and welfare of ch uh, the child. Um, of the African countries, 41 have ratified, nine have signed, and five have not uh, taken a step there are uh, independent, some in some countries, independent children's rights institutions. Um, but there's, um, and this is true of other places in the world. Um, there was a study now dated uh, from uh, UN Innocenti about children's ombudspersons around the world. But it's a it's a great question. Um, Stefan asked, "Are you aware of children's rights institutions in which children themselves take part in leadership?" Um, uh, why don't we quickly have um, Emily and, and Bruce um, Agnes respond? I think probably my, my information is outdated, so Bruce is better placed to give you an update here. Uh, it's, it's, it's my absolute favorite thing. We're, we're, we're still learning, but I've had, um, when I, as I said, when I, when I first got appointed, we traveled around the country and spoke to children and young people, and that was one of the big things that they wanted to know more about, is how they could get involved. And so we've had a series of young advisors groups um, and the, the current, the current um, which has evolved each year, I've now actually got three groups. One is, um, is looking uh, particularly at the Enoch topic, what, which was the environment um, and, and is now ICRIs. One is actually using, I've delegated my investigation powers to them. And so they've got a project which they've decided to focus on mental health. 
um, and they're actually using the investigation of powers in the office on their own with, with some staff support, but not directed by me, which we're going to write up as, as a model as well. And then there's a separate governance group. And I think this, this one is one that, that I think is really interesting in that they helped young advisors help write our strategic plan, but we're now trying to get them involved in um, budget setting within the office and even bring them into kind of audit and other elements of the office as well. And so we've always tried to get them involved in the way in which we work, but it's an evolving, evolving process. And, and I think that that's probably true with a lot of colleagues as, as well, is that um, it's something that we're still kind of developing. And, and I would say in Scotland, we generally work with older children as well, kind of, kind of 12, 14, 14 and, and above, we're not as good at involving younger children um, in our work in terms of the governance and running of the office. We do a lot of work with them on policy and kind of project issues, a lot of work out and about engaging with them. But in terms of those questions about how we spend our money, how we run our governance, how we prioritize our work, um, I think there's some more work to do about how you involve children and young people in, in our governance, but we're trying to develop some good practice models. Thank you. Uh, Stefan asks how to navigate the question of true political power and support. As an ICRI, the institution is not part of the government. As an ombudsman, governmental office, political power is soft. Is that a frustrating situation between dependence and independence? I'm not sure that's inaccurate. Um, whether it's true that political power is soft, I think um, many of you are endowed with powers. And in fact, I mean, politics will always respond. It's a universal um, matter that politicians will respond to child protection issues. They often respond very quickly and very publicly to issues uh, that concern the public. So something that will concern their voters. We had uh, an instance here in Ireland where a government fell because of its mishandling of child protection. So uh, I, would, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't go so far as to call it soft. I think, uh, your work and the evidence that you get and um, that you publicly inform and educate about can be greater than than described as soft. And, and, and if I could jump in as well, so we, we do, as, as others do, have, have some hard powers in terms of strategic litigation and investigations, which, 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 are, which are much stronger powers. And again, some of the quasi-judicial functions that, that, that some um, ICRIs have uh, are, are hard power. But, um, but that, that kind of soft power, kind of profile and influencing is absolutely key. And I think that was one of the, the really important things in protecting the independence of our office. Um, it was also important that the office was given the resources and status to, to have that influence. And so again, we have a very high media, media presence um, very high kind of social media presence. Um, we're able to, to support children and young people to have their voices heard. Um, and I think that we would see that as an essential part of that independence is also being able to be to be heard and being able to to influence, um, and and that does require the protection of the office to to stand up and challenge government. But also, there's some some kind of the reality of it is that um, challenging the government um, on unpopular issues uh, is still very popular in media terms. So it makes for good stories when the and so there's very few things that I say that don't get picked up very very quickly by the media because generally i'm holding government and those in power to account and so even when i'm putting forward a politically unpopular or, or generally unpopular view it still gets a, a lot of kind of coverage and there's this power in kind of in, in building some of that as well and creating those conversations in communities this um i, I would sorry Frank, can i just add I, I think um one of the interesting things i think the complaints process is a is a really direct level of accountability uh, where uh, the the office certainly in our experience um, it's not a good day for for a public servant when they receive a complaint by the ombudsman for children nobody wants to be at the wrong end of that so I think that does play out in in children's favor um, where I would be slightly more critical I think is in relation to the impact of the work that's done around advice and and uh, guidance to government endless reports and in, in this sort of um, and analyses from a convention point of view of law and policy, which don't get any response, where there's no follow through on what exactly has been done with the Ombudsman's advice. I think that's an area where we need to really look at how we can better, I suppose, be more systematic in how that's done at a national level, in particular, 
perhaps developing a, a, a level of parliamentary, formal parliamentary scrutiny of legislation, because I think that you could spend all of your resource responding to, to legislative proposals and making useful comments that never get picked up because there's no uh, requirement legally for government to respond to you or to, to take that on, to take that advice on board. Thank you. The, um, we have two related questions that I'll, um, I think, Ursula just uh, tapped into all of you. Uh, Sandrine asks, after assessing some challenges faced by children to address their complaints or having access to some procedures to address their problems, what are some tangible initiatives taken? I think you've talked a little bit about that, but um, if you want to spend a moment. And then Nick uh, asked, do children's commissioners have a responsibility to influence public opinion? Um, if you guys want to respond. I would just say briefly that the that certainly in our experience um, and being at the other side of this as well, the, the Ombudsman's complaints function is at its best uh, when it's looking at systematic or system change. Emily gave a very good example of it in relation to the, the girl and the, the policy around wheelchair access. Um, and I think then, you know, that's, that's, that's a key thing. I think you could equally, and this is often the criticism of those offices that have the complaints function, you could spend all of your resource responding to individual, very worthy uh, children's complaints. Um, but if that's not going to bring about a more systematic change, uh, change in culture, change in policy, change in the way resources are decided, that's really, um, you know, an, an, a sort of thankless job in a way. So looking for the ways in which you can translate your individual complaints into something more systematic or system wide, I think is really key. Being strategic about how those are used and picking those up and using them then uh, on the own volition, um, more widespread investigations. I think that's that's really where uh, the, the offices um, come into their own. Um, I want to invite um, Linda McDonald, come back to Linda, and then also uh, another person attending named Ivy, if she would want to, if, if Ivy would want to speak up in a moment as well. But Linda, are you able to ask your question? Okay. I mean, Ivy, if you um, are able to just, uh, Ivy put into the Q&A, she is... Um, a child's rights advocate from Kenya. So uh, the earlier question around Africa, um, she says that she's noted key similarities between the different jurisdictions and the Kenyan framework in the protection of children, uh, particularly the provisions of the new Kenyan Children's Act of 2022. Um, okay, so thank you. And then uh, I see a note. Um, Linda, it seems that we cannot unmute you. Um, we're not sure why. So if you want to post a question in the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Um, if it's OK, I'll answer a few questions about the United States. Um, Michelle Gatto asked, what impact does it have that the United States hasn't ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child? Is there an international push to get the US to sign and create an ombudsman office? Um, and then uh, Kate asks, um, I know the US perspective on this. She's curious, do the panelists have any anecdotal experience with their observations of the US political and institutional maneuverings? Um, I'm picking up on similar trends from our panel's experiences. So I'll just quickly respond to one of those and then uh, turn it over to the panelists about what they see about the United States. Um, the United States, of course, is the only UN member party that's not ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, oh, thanks. Um, we, um, about half of our states have set up independent children's rights institutions, but they're very different from what you find elsewhere. Um, and one of the ways that they're different is that they do not concentrate on the rights of all young people. Um, we have two uh, ombudspersons that kind of do, but for the most part, they either, um, they focus on children in state custody, either in detention or in foster care. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. There, um, there are efforts here in the United States that have been going on for quite a while about uh, persuading leadership of the U.S. government to ratify. Um, and um, when uh, the first effort was made, uh, more conservative forces were stronger. And so um, and it was also a matter of poor political timing. Uh, since then, there have been uh, attempts to ratify the U.N. Convention. Um, I'm not, I won't say it's just a matter of time because that may be wrong, 
But I will say that the United States actually has ratified two optional protocols to the convention. Um, uh, the uh, one on involvement of children in armed conflict and the other on sale of children, prostitution, and pornography. So in the United States, we often think that um, the Democrats are the ones who are going to push for the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But important to note that these two optional protocols were pursued during Republican administrations. Um, so there are calls made to uh, ratify the UN Convention on right now. Um, and there are also calls uh, to establish a national independent children's rights institution um, by the American Bar, Bar Association, um, including someone named Howard Davidson. So thank you. And then I'll turn to the panelists about their perceptions of the United States um, and, and what we're doing and not doing uh, when it comes to children's rights, including in front of the UN. I'll, I'll just jump in very briefly while, while people are gathering their thoughts. I think there's a um, we, we um, published an edited collection uh, last year, uh, myself and a few colleagues, including Laura Lundy uh, from Queens, around the um, legal incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we probably controversially included a chapter on the United States from Jonathan Todras from Georgia State. And, and I think the point we were making was that actually an awful lot can be achieved without ratification, while ratification is the optimum. Um, there are examples of how um, both states and, um, and cities, in fact, are taking the Convention on Children's Rights seriously in ways that are very creative. Um, and obviously, we have the example um, of how the Supreme Court has picked up the Convention in, the, in, in Roper and Simmons and another case law relating to, to children and, and sentencing. So I think, um, you know, there are, there are it's, it's hard to dismiss or hard to ignore that the lack of ratification, but I think there are some good examples of how the Convention can nonetheless have an impact. I, I, I don't have a, a huge lot to, to add to that, apart from it always makes for an interesting kind of question when you speak to children and young people about the kind of near universal ratification and, and ask them which country they think um, hasn't ratified, um, which, which we do. But I, th I think, I think um, following on from Ursula's point that it, it's hugely important ratifications is, is what we need. But um, when you look around the country, at the, the, look around the world at the human rights records of many countries that have ratified, um, the focus needs to be on implementation. Again, and again, that's a really interesting discussion I often get into with children and young people saying, does that mean that, that the US has got the worst children's rights record in, in, in the world? And, and, and actually, yeah, so, so absolutely important. But in, term, in terms of the influence that it, that it has in terms of um, setting a standard for derogation, um, it's actually the implementation that we see that, that kind of leads the kind of drive to work worse protections when, when states, including the UK, um, derogates from rights responsibilities and attacks human rights protections, that sends a very negative message internationally that others could, could do that. Um, I don't get the same sense that the kind of lack of ratification from, um, from, from the US has that same impact as some of the, the derogations that we see um, in other parts of the world, like, like the UK, where where the Human Rights Act is under, under attack, and, and that sends a very negative, negative message um, about reducing rights protections. Thank Maybe if, if, as, as a observing, I think, Brian, correct me if I'm not, uh, if I'm wrong, but also CEDO has not been ratified by right. the US. So I think, I think, I, I don't think it is about children only. It is, it has to do about this, this complicated idea that the US has as a, being a, well, the, the, the chosen country and to lead the others. And so why would they then abide by international law? And it, it has to do, I think, much more with internal dynamics of another kind than being open or not to children's rights, youth rights, et cetera. At least I recall, and, and in my literature, I always go back to Hillary Rodham's piece of 1972, Children Under the Law. And it is still such a great piece of work. And so many lawyers, uh, legal scholars have, have given us, I mean, us elsewhere in Europe and in the world tools to think about, to work with, and have been pioneering on children's rights. So, I, and I don't think it's something like the US would be against children's rights. But I do think where to situate the debate, it's, it's about its complicated relationship the country has, and of course it's bipartisan system, and it's very, well, uh, well, the way how politics are developing, that are stronger explanatory factors than just being in favor or against children's rights. I don't think that's where, the nod lies. It's also CEDO. Right? It's, it's, uh, and just to give, I had a, 
a student of mine did a work a while ago, but comparing CRPD, so the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And their Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was adopted. And how comes and why? And while it was about a storytelling about uh, veterans, war veterans who are, who are living with a, with, with a, a physical handicap. So, and they were included, and the, these are the heroes. <laughs> And then the women and the children, all and, and it's all about swap. Well, this this kind of um, well, that's, that's how I understood it of lobbying and counter lobbying and and people having power of of defining terms. That explains much more than I would say. And I think that in the country itself there is, of course, a rich debate, and with all the different uh, ideas around very paternalist anti-child rights, but also very very progressive ways of looking at children's rights and young people's rights. So. I think that's as an observer from outside. From Thank you. Um, I have tried to unmute uh, Linda and Ivy, and I'm not sure that has succeeded. I think. Um, we should uh, say thank you for everyone attending and um, I um, will before I turn it over to Sonia to wind up and Agnes, um, I just want to thank Ann Ghazi who is the person behind the scenes who's made all of these things magically happen. Um, so thank you to Anne and, and thank you to all the panelists and uh, uh, Sonia, Lydia and Anastasia, Jill, thank you. On behalf of the Schubert Center for Child Studies, I'd like to thank our panelists, Ursula Kilkelly, Bruce Adamson and Agnes Lux, our discussion. Um, Carl Hansen and moderator Brian Grand and Linda Balog and all of our guests who attended today um, this very um, wonderful and informative international discussion on children's rights. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>